Bueno, sí, ok. Buenos días a todas y todos. Bienvenidos al Instituto de Investigaciones Económicas de la UNAM y bienvenidos a esta eh, conferencia magistral impartida por el doctor Jan Kregel, pues que nos habla sobre qué, qué ha sucedido con los nuevos paradigmas en economía, ¿no? so sobre todo dado el contexto de crisis de los paradigmas existentes. Eh, queremos agradecer a la doctora Alicia Girón por haber organizado esta, eh, eh, no solo el curso que tuvimos el día de ayer con el doctor Jan Kregel, sino también esta conferencia que seguramente va a ser muy, muy interesante y que nos va a hacer pensar nuevas ideas sobre hacia dónde va la economía en los próximos eh, años. Sin más, este, le, le paso la palabra al doctor Kregel para que dé inicio su conferencia magistral. Doctor Kregel. Ok, thank you, Armand. I'm going to start out on a voyage that was started 50 years ago when there was the idea that somehow or other there was going to be a rejection of neoclassical neoliberal economics and it was going to be replaced by something that we called post-Keynesian economics. Uh, I wrote in i think it was 1973 a book which was called an introduction to post-keynesian economics alfred eichner who was a uh, colleague of mine and i wrote a paper that was in fact invited by the uh, journal of economic literature at that time to outline to the rest of the economics profession just exactly what this new what we then called paradigm in economics was supposed to be and it was considered as what as i mentioned what was supposed to take the place or to provide the alternative to uh, neoclassical economics the title which i've chosen here is whatever happened to post keynesian economics is to try to explain why what we thought was going to become the new paradigm in economics didn't, and why the essential elements of that new paradigm, which provide, I think, the basis, the modern basis, for looking at the interrelation between the problems of the financial sector and the real sector, have tended to be ignored in the current literature, and how we might try to bring them back into normal discussion. So this is going to be in part a historical story. It's going to be in part linked to what we did yesterday evening, because we're going to be looking at the relationship of this particular approach to what we called, uh, we looked at the neoliberal approach yesterday, in particular, their analysis of the labor market and the relationship between the national state, the democratic decision by national states over public policy, and the idea that there was some sort of external or overriding market mechanism, and that that market mechanism was really the thing that uh, provided the way the economy was supposed to uh, was supposed to function so just as a slight example i used the famous google trends or whatever it is the thing that you can look on the net and they can tell you how many people are interested in things or others and i've plotted these against the blue is the post keynesian economics the red is monetarism which became the counter to keynesian economics the quantity theory of money which is the looks purple to me i don't know what color it looks like to you which is the one up there on top and maintains its position this is over a period of the last 20 years uh without changing if you look at the uh the lines on the bottom, you'll see that post Keynesian economics starts out very well and they are still in the early period, declines very rapidly. The post Keynesian, well, in the beginning, you have a number of positive sites and then it declines. 
Recently, I've also added in the so-called modern monetary theory, modern monetary theory, which has a good start, collapses. Uh, then in the later period, that is in the last three or four years, has a big bump, and it also is now starting to disappear in precisely the same way that uh, that post-Keynesian economics did. So this gives you an idea, that's just the second one. This gives you an idea that really the dominant uh, approach in terms of the general, and we'll call this general public, the general appreciation of the general public, because these are not all economists who are sitting there on Google and Googling the various things, that it's the quantity theory of money, which is the counterpart. And this is going to be one of the messages which I want to leave to you is that if you look at the general theory and Keynes' elaboration on the general theory and subsequently in papers which he published in discussions with his critics in, for example, there's a preface to the French edition of the, of the general theory, which is also very explicit. He makes the point that I was rebelling not so much against basic neoclassical economics, I was rebelling against the quantity theory of money. And if we think of the evolution of post-Keynesian theory throughout the 1970s and 1980s, the alternative, which has been the most prevalent, has been monetarism. Monetarism in the Friedman version, and the Friedman version is the, what he called the reconsideration or the restatement of the quantity theory of money. So basically what we're going to be looking at is to say just exactly what did Keynes mean when we had the, uh, when he identified the quantity theory of money as the point which caused him the greatest difficulty in terms of developing his in terms of developing his theory so if we look start back very quickly what was the theory supposed to be post keynesian economics was supposed to be what well was it the keynes or the post keynes or was it the hyphen between the post and the keynes we had debates between the various parts of the uh, proponents of post keynesian theory of whether or not it was appropriate to have the hyphen in the title and I still now can't remember what it meant to have or not have the hyphen. But the question then became just exactly whether this was something which came post, it came after Keynes or development of Keynes, or something which was new, some development of Keynes which didn't exist. John Robinson had started very early in uh, writing about what she called the generalization of the general theory, which she started producing analysis already in the end of the 1930s, and then more uh, clearly in the 1950s in discussing the work of Roy Herod and Evzi Domar. And for Joan Robinson, basically, her idea was that Keynes' general theory was a short period theory. The short period theory meant in Marshallian terms that the capital stock was given. If you remember, Marshall has the market period, the short period, and the long period. In the long period, the capital stock can change. Investment takes place. So her idea was to generalize the general theory to include these long period changes in the level of the capital stock by means of the explanation of by means of the explanation of investment. So this was basically her idea. And the idea was that the focus was then on what? In investment and on capital. And we're familiar with the capital theory debates, her criti criticism of the production function. And all of this was in that particular context of trying to create a Keynesian theory which took care of what we would now call dynamic theory, adjustments of the system of the system over time. Having been a student of John Robinson's, I was indoctrinated very quickly in this, uh, in this particular approach. Unfortunately, I had also studied with Paul Davidson, uh, 
before I went to Cambridge to become a student of Joan Robinson's. And Davidson in particular, and then Hyman Minsky, who subsequently, uh, after he came to visit Cambridge, became a very good friend of mine, had a very different idea of what post-Keynesian was supposed to be. And this eventually came to be called the American uh, post-Keynesian idea. And that was that money was the center. That is the definition, the analysis of money and monetary policy was the essential element. Now, money in these terms is linked very clearly with the ideas of uncertainty. And as you probably know, Davidson is very clearly associated with the idea of developing the distinction between ergodic and non-ergodic uncertainty and the way this provides an analysis of monetary factors. Okay, So that if you compare this approach to the long period Marshallian approach, if you're looking at a long period growth model, a long period growth model is basically a stationary state model. Okay, John Robinson talked about the impossibility of having uncertainty in these models. Okay, so you had expectations that were satisfied over time. So clearly there was a distinction between, on the one hand, emphasizing what was a very much a Schumpeterian approach of looking at the long period development of a system and those who were looking at the monetary factors. To make problems worse, Davidson and Minsky didn't agree on what the basic monetary factors were. As we said, Davidson focused on what he called fundamental uncertainty and the idea that the general theory provided an explanation of an equilibrium state at less than full employment. Minsky, on the other hand, looked at not the equilibrium state, but argued that Keynes' theory was really a cycle theory. That is, Keynes was looking at a theory of monetary cycles. So that the two of them never managed to agree with the way money entered into the Keynesian system. Minsky said, yes, I have a system which is both short and long period, but it's unstable. And we're familiar with the Minsky theory of financial instability. But the financial instability was one which not necessarily ignored, but did not take very much into account the fact that unemployment could be a condition of the natural state of equilibrium in the system. So within this particular, uh, particular element, there's also what we will call the Franco-Italian uh, circuit approach. There are a number of French economists and Italian economists who developed on the basis of the treatise on money, the idea of the monetary circuit. And this was also a monetary aspect but it was a monetary aspect which didn't agree with either the Minsky or the Davidson approach, so that you ended up with three different approaches within this, uh, this element. Now, there's also a range of uh, economists who looked at this primarily simply as a way of replacing the neoclassical synthesis. That is the argument that Keynesian theory, or at least fiscal theory, on the public policy level was fine. Aggregate demand determined the level of output, but the problem that you had was to determine the micro foundations. And it was this neoclassical synthesis, which supposedly was launched by Paul Samuelson and a number of other uh, MIT economists, which then required building a post Keynesian theory by replacing the micro theory that existed. And you had theories of the degree of monopoly, Koleski, for example, and a number of others emphasis, emphasized the degree of monopoly. You had uh, explanations which took into account the fact that you had a change emphasis on prices, Al Eichner's theory, which uh, 
he introduced into the post Keynesian theory was that prices, in fact, were not necessarily monopolistic or oligopolistic, but that megacorps, large corporations, set their prices in order to determine their cash flows. And they determined the cash flows in order to generate the investment, the financing, which was required for uh, that was required for their investments. So this was the uh, the basic idea that motivated these economists was that we're trying to replace those bits and pieces of the theory which are closely related to the neoclassical synthesis and to provide an alternative in that uh, in that particular way. Then. After this, I have noted down at the bottom the famous triad in Trieste. Uh, this refers to a summer school that I organized with Sergio Peronello and Pierangelo Garignani in Trieste, Italy in the, uh, in the 1980s with the idea that we were trying to integrate or to join together the Serafian classical approach to pricing and uh, long period theory and the post Keynesian theory. So the alternative that came out at the bottom was that this was an attempt to provide a combined theory that took into account the work of Piero Sraffa, represented by Piero Ando Garignani on the one hand, uh, the emphasis on international trade theory, which was, which was reformulated as a result of the capital theory debates, and the post-Keynesian theory. And the three of us joined together in order to, uh, to create this summer school, which lasted, if memory serves me, for about 10 years. Uh, my own position eventually ended up as being the one which tried to integrate the post-Keynesian and the Serafian school. I've done a number of work with uh, uh, Alessandro Roncaglia, who was a Serafian scholar, in order to try and propose some possibility of looking at this as a joint, uh, as a joint endeavor. The bottom line of all of this is that now, not only, as I mentioned, did post-Keynesian theory not become the new paradigm, but we never managed to create that intersection or that joining of those two uh, those two particular particular approaches. So this is what what we thought was happening, or what we thought was happening in that particular period. Now the question is what what went wrong, aside from the fact of having these competing internal. Uh, interpretations of just exactly what post Keynesian theory turned out to be. Now, the first thing is looking at fiscal policy. The basic models that were used to justify Keynesian deficit expenditures were, in fact, what we used to call the 45 degree line diagram or what became the Hicks Hansen ISLM diagram. And if you ask the question, where are prices? in that particular theory, the answer is that there are none. Why? Because basically the ISLM diagram was an elaboration of a theory that Hicks had been working out and eventually came out in value and capital and was more fully expressed in the in part two of value and capital, the part that nobody reads, uh, which was basically a neo volrasian model in which you have a number of sectors, that is, instead of having individual supply and demand relationships, you have a sector which is the consumption sector, a sector which is the investment sector, and so forth, and you're looking for the equilibrium across these sectors. Now, all of these sectors require a unit of account, and that unit of account, or as we would say, the the equation or the price which solves the model, in Hicks's model was the price of bread. So the price of bread was given at one, and that's how you solved Hicks's ISLM model. Well, obviously, there were no prices here because you have fixed the one price of a consumption good, and that was bread, and you had used that price Okay, in order to establish the equilibrium across these different sectors. So buried within this 
ISLM model was this, what eventually became a, uh, an explosive problem when faced with trying to determine inflation. And this is what eventually, in the stagflation of the uh, late 1950s and then the 1960s more generally, led to the problem of stagflation and basically the end of the so-called neoclassical synthesis. Why? Well, Keynesian economists were sort of in a box at that point. You had fiscal policy, and fiscal policy was supposed to be the policy that determined aggregate demand, and it determined employment. So if you had less than full employment, you were supposed to expand government expenditure, and you did this by deficit financing. On the other hand, if you had inflation and prices were rising, you really had no explanation of how prices were formed, but your policy was to reduce the level of demand. Because if prices were rising, aggregate demand was obviously excess to aggregate supply, so you were supposed to be cutting government expenditure and cutting deficit spending. So that the Keynesian economists were stuck with a policy which was internally contradictory. Obviously, you can't be increasing and decreasing government expenditure and the deficit both at the same time. And it's at this stage that Milton Friedman came into the story and said, well, there is this thing called the quantity theory. And if we reconsider the quantity theory, we bring back the major role of monetary policy in determining the price level. If you look at the Keynesian theory, the Keynesian theory has no explanation of price. And in fact, the story that I've told about fighting inflation with fiscal policy says that monetary policy no, has no essential role in the process. So he had a very compelling story, compelling historically. That is, I said, look, we have this long history of the quantity theory. It provides us with an explanation of prices. Changes in the money supply change the price level. It gives us a monetary policy. The monetary policy is to control the creation of the money supply. And that way you can control inflation. So that it became the basic, what eventually we call the Keynesian, the, the Keynesian counter-revolution that Friedman launched and said, well, you really don't need these Keynesian policies. All you need is a central bank which follows a monetary supply rule or a basic monetary supply rule. Now, at that point, everybody started to say, well, now Keynes is dead. Why? Because in addition to the introduction of the quantity theory, at the same time, Friedman extended this analysis to something which eventually became the expectations augmented Phillips curve. Now, Friedman did not invent the Phillips curve. Phillips invented the Phillips curve. And the Phillips curve was, at the beginning, a simple statistical observation, which said that if you look at relationships in the, uh, in the labor market, that wages and employment tend to be linked with each other. When wages rise more rapidly, then prices tend to rise more rapidly. And the extension to this was what? Well, if wages are rising more rapidly, what's happening is the central bank is validating the increase in wages by increasing the money supply. So in fact, what you've done now is to link the labor market into the explanation of the price level. And at this time, everybody talked about wage push or cost push, uh, cost push inflation. Uh, Jimmy Carter is now very much in the news. Jimmy Carter probably came to grief because as a president, he was faced with the problem of how trying to solve inflation with a central bank that continually tended to validate monetary increases and employment con unemployment continued to rise. And he then decided that he would adopt 
an alternative policy by appointing Paul Volcker to the Federal Reserve. And Paul Volcker announced that he was going to adopt the policy, which was not necessarily the policy that Friedman had recommended, but something which was very close. That is, that the central bank would be monitoring the supply of money rather than trying to set interest rates as we currently do in the modern session. Now, this expectations augmented Phillips curve did what? Well, it very quickly produced a thing which we call rational expectations. Now, rational expectations within that context are what? Well, it simply said that if we know that there is a statistical relationship between wages and prices and wages are validated by increases in the money supply, then if you're a policymaker, okay, you have a very sensible policy, a sensible policy, which is what? Well, if you've seen it function in the past, you probably think it's going to function as well in the future. So you adapt your policy in order to take this into account. And basically, this is what rational expectations argued, was that it was impossible to use any other type of policies in order to influence the level of unemployment. Unemployment would be set at the rate at which rational expectations confirmed the existing level of unemployment. Now, this is what eventually produced, as we said, the idea that Keynesian, first of all, that Keynesian theory was dead. And secondly, it produced what I are, like to argue was that the was the wrong debate. It was the wrong the wrong fight because the fight was what the fight was over whether or not fiscal policy was still relevant in a rational expectations model. The post Keynesians continued to argue yes that fiscal policy was important. The rational expectations theorist argued on the other hand and said, well, if you know that every time you increase aggregate demand, that the increase in aggregate demand is going to be convalidated by an increase in the money supply and an increase in wages and an increase in prices, then you're not any farther along than you are in the beginning because the wage increases will be automatically eliminated by the increase in inflation that comes afterwards. So basically, not only was this an argument which said the Keynesian theory was dead, it was sort of handcuffs on fiscal policy because it argued basically that fiscal policy could not change the level of unemployment. And you now understand why Keynes is dead because the entire post-Keynesian theory was now predicated on the fact that this macro policy argument was the basis of the theory. All we had to do was to shift aggregate demand up and down and we could shift unemployment up and down, okay? Now, this is something of a paradox because all of this was couched within this argument, which was called the micro foundations of macroeconomics. Okay, the argument continued that you know, as long as Keynesian theory had no micro foundations, then rational expectations would be, would be dominant. Now, the question became, was that correct? Was it true? Well, nobody, in fact, ever asked that question, and nobody ever managed to look. And this is why I call this the paradox, because, first of all, Keynes tells us on numerous occasions that his fight against neoclassical theory was, in fact, a fight to liberate himself from the quantity theory of money, to provide an alternative to the quantity theory of money. Now, the quantity theory of money, as we said, is what? Well, in terms of Fisher's equation of exchange, or even in terms of Marshall's quantity theory, okay, it's a theory of prices. Okay, even David Hume explained this to us. Okay, so that when we're talking about the quantity theory, we're in fact talking about a theory of prices. If you reject the quantity theory and you provide an alternative theory, obviously you're providing an alternative theory of prices. So there must be a theory of prices someplace in the general theory. Okay, now where is it? Well, it's hidden. I shouldn't have said hidden, it's couched within the concept of liquidity preference. 
liquidity preference, if you take the theory that we commonly propose, one that you know, I have proposed, Hyman Minsky has proposed, a number of people have proposed, liquidity preference is, well, for Minsky, it's a theory of asset prices. I would go one step further and say liquidity preference is a theory of goods prices as well as asset prices, the way it's developed in the general theory. And I'll try and present evidence a bit later uh, in the lecture of how Keynes conceived of this being a substitute theory of prices, using again, not my inventions, but using his own words, words that were published by Hugh Townsend, some one uh, acolyte of Keynes at the, at the time period, and to suggest that there is a possibility of providing an alternative theory if we clearly understand what liquidity preference is telling us. Now, the difficulty with this is that if you look at the representation of liquidity preference within the standard Hicksian ISLM approach to the neoclassical synthesis, it's simply an expression of the demand for money. It looks very much like the Marshallian interpretation of the demand for money. And in fact, Hicks tells us that when he writes the article. He says, well, here I have liquidity preference. This looks very much like the money market, and this is the demand for money, and he leaves it there. So all of this additional baggage that liquidity preference was carrying in Keynes' view simply disappears on the fact that, oh, liquidity preference, that's the demand for money. We know what the demand for money is. And unfortunately, Keynes himself gave support to this interpretation by providing what we now, people normally teach in introductory courses of the various components of the demand for money, you have transactions demand, precautionary demand, speculative demand, so on and so forth. So it's a straightforward demand for money function, right? For Keynes, on the other hand, liquidity preference was a theory of asset prices, but it was also a theory of interest rates. Interest rates, why? Well, interest rates are always, and Keynes always gives his definition, and it's interesting that his definition is exactly the same as Irving Fisher's. He said the interest rate is something that's very simple. An interest rate is a price today relative to a price tomorrow as a proportion of the original price. It's an arithmetic calculation, okay? So an interest rate is what? An arithmetic calculation, fine, but that arithmetic calculation requires what? It requires prices. It requires, in Keynes terminology, spot and forward prices. It requires financial markets or goods markets in which you have prices that are quoted for current delivery and prices that are quoted for forward delivery, okay? And this is the essence of Minsky's idea that it's a theory of financial asset prices because, and this is where expectations now comes into the story, Keynes says, one of the major, major differences of my theory relative to the neoclassical theory is that I take into account the impact of the future on the present. What does that mean? Well, the future is simply that those forward prices, those expected prices that determine the arithmetic calculation are prices that are based on expectations that entrepreneurs or even consumers do not know with certainty. So if you look at this as the representation, this is basically the representation that Keynes is looking at. Now, the other part of the what went wrong, if you see the scribbles up here, these are scribbles from some of Hyminsky's notes that, uh, that he used, is that Keynesian theory is not just a theory that validates demand management by fiscal policy. Okay, this is Minsky telling us, no, there is a price theory behind this. All that was assimilated from Keynes by the policy establishment and its clients was the analysis of an economy in deep depression and a policy tool of deficit financing. Okay, So the argument that Minsky makes is that you have to look to liquidity preference in order to do this. All right. Now, 
I'm going to take a step back and link up. Remember yesterday we talked about these neoliberal arguments in terms of what was required in terms of the labor market as adjustment. That is, the labor market theory was supposed to be the theory that was responsive to what were these extra uh, supranational controls imposed either by some legislative process at the supranational level or the multinational level, or by the gold standard as a multinational uh, set of institutions. Milton Friedman adopted a very similar type of argument, okay, in terms of, as I said, his elaboration, uh, eventual elaboration of the, uh, of the Phillips curve. So the response that was made, and again, this was made by economists were in general, who were in general in favor of the public policy approach of deficit spending was to solve the problem of the missing micro foundations by introducing the Phillips curve. So the invisible theory of prices provided the justification for considering the Keynes theory, first of all, as being simply in real terms. If you don't see the prices, you can't see the, uh, you do all of your analysis in real terms. Second, it would be compatible with supporting government demand management in the form of fine tuning of real expenditures, but missing any microeconomic analysis of markets and prices. Now, as an aside, those of you who are familiar with Hyman Minsky's work, this is the point where Minsky parted company with the neoclassical synthesis. That is, he said, basically, that missing part, those missing prices, are financial asset prices and those financial asset prices which are can possibly create instability even if the real system is in equilibrium that is minsky's argument of endogenous instability is the argument that you can have a Keynesian demand management policy in the real sector the real sector can be in equilibrium but the financial prices can be completely out of whack and they can eventually cause a crisis or instability, which causes the system causes the system to break down. Now, as I've already mentioned, the response to the dilemma was in terms of the Phillips curve. This was given a uh, strong support by a, an elaboration by Bob Solo and Paul Samuelson in uh, the beginning of the 1960s. And it suggested that, well, we really don't have to worry about not having a price theory, but what we do have now is a trade-off, okay? Now, you can see the logic behind this. The logic behind this was either you have deficit spending or you have deficit reduction. Okay. Now you're saying, well, this is really not a direct confrontation. It's a question of policy preferences. You can have a little bit more inflation and you can have a little bit less unemployment or vice versa. So the theory is not completely void of content. It now brings back the policy content. And eventually, as we said at the bottom, what happens was that if you look at the, what was then the standard macroeconomic textbook uh, that was used in most master's degree courses in the United States, ISLM suddenly appeared with a Phillips curve added on to the end of it, and this is how you manage the prices. Now, Friedman joined this particular debate by First of all, having as, a, as an objective, eliminating that trade-off, okay? And basically what he was attempting to do was to build on what we called previously this expectations augmented Phillips curve, which is an expression of rational expectations, uh, to say that really there was no trade-off, that it was impossible to use fiscal policy to create a little bit more inflation but a little less unemployment. That is basically you were stuck. Now, we're going to go through 
two very important pieces that Friedman published that line up, as I've mentioned, with the discussion of yesterday in terms of the way the neoliberal uh, economists looked at the operation of the financial system. In a very important article in 1948, he set out a monetary framework for public policy. And that monetary framework was what? Well, basically, this monetary framework should operate under the, and I'm now quoting from Friedman's article, under the rule of law rather than the discretionary authority of administrators. Okay, does this sound familiar? Well, if you follow the debates in the United States over Federal Reserve policy, it's a question number one, is the Federal Reserve an independent entity or is it determined by political considerations or should you go an additional step and simply reduce the policy options of the Federal Reserve to setting a single rate of money supply expansion, okay? Now, this reflected what? This reflected the framework of the business cycle theorists, the Aust Austrian business cycle theorists at the time, who had argued that, yes, Schumpeter was right, Banks can create money out of nothing, which may be very useful, but is also fraught with risk because there is always the possibility that the politicians of the nation state will get control of the central bank. And if they get control of the central bank, they're going to increase or attempt to increase the money supply. And by increasing the money supply, they're simply going to cause inflation. So that the monetary framework was this. And if you look at it, it's extremely clever. Friedman says, let's set up fiscal policy by having a full employment budget. The government passes a full employment budget. It takes away the power to create money from the central bank. In fact, it takes away from the private banks the possibility of creating money. And this is simply a reflection of what we call the 100% reserve policy or the Chicago plan, which was promoted by economists in the University of Chicago in the 1940s and the 1950s. So you have the full employment budget and you have an actual budget that is obviously, if you set out a budget, you know that the budget never turns out to be exactly as you expect it. It's very interesting that now it's very difficult to explain to politicians that the budget result is an endogenous process. It's not an exogenous process. It's not because you wrote the budget the wrong way. It's because the budget didn't turn out the way you thought it would. So you have this distinction between the full employment budget and the actual budget. And basically what the actual budget does is to use tax and expenditure policy in order to try and meet the target or the objective of the full employment budget. So if you look at this sort of policy, the net result is what? Well, first, there's no place for discretionary government and a cyclical demand management policy. You've already put that into the budget. That is, you've passed this in the budget agreement. It's a full employment budget. There's no place for monetary policy because you've eliminated the possibility of the central bank to create money by, by means of fractional reserve banking. Now, as I said, this was 1948. And interestingly enough, this paper was, uh, shall we say, appreciated by most Keynesian economists. And you can understand why. If you have full employment written into the Constitution, that's fine. But the problem is that you've also written into the Constitution the rule of law, which says that the central bank has no control over monetary policy. Okay. Now, this is the source of eventually, when we talk about Friedman's policy, okay, that monetary policy in the long run has no impact on the system. Here, this is being written in to this famous uh, monetary framework. That was 1948. Okay, 1948 went through a period of what? Well, recovery, 
inflation was around the Korean War, you had recovery in the 1950s, and then eventually we're back to our period of stagflation, okay? And the Phillips curve. Friedman comes back now in 19, this is 1968, if I remember right. Yes, it's 1968, with his presidential address to the American Economic Association. And this time he's not looking at long-term monetary policy, he's looking at short-term monetary policy. Okay, we've already gotten rid of long-term fiscal policy, short-term fiscal policy, long-term monetary policy. The only thing that's left for, and again, think back to the fear of the neoliberals of the democratic governments introducing policies which would countervene the laws of the market, we're now going to take out that last risk that democratically elected governments would have an impact through policy on economic conditions. So he looks here, and since the argument is a bit complicated, I'm going to read through the, uh, read through the description, because in the next slide, I'm going to point out an error in this policy, an error which up to this point, only about three people in the world have noticed uh, because this analysis continues to remain the analysis which is dominant uh, in the system. Okay, If the monetary authority tries to peg the market rate of unemployment at a level of 3%, that is below the natural rate. Okay, Now, look what we've done here. We've already presumed that there is a natural rate, and that natural rate is the rate which comes out of the, of the Phillips curve. Okay, Now, if we say the government decides that it's going to use monetary policy to get the rate down below that, it's going to be 3%. When prices and wages have been stable and level and expectations of real and nominal wages and prices are stable by the authority, increasing the rate of growth, monetary growth, making nominal cash balances higher than people desire. Okay, We have a natural rate of growth. We have a position in which everything has been perfectly fine, perfectly stable, expectations have been formed on the basis of repetitive experience. And now the central bank comes in and says, we want to push down unemployment below that natural rate. And it's going to be, he just picks 3%. And here is the argument. Income and spending will take the form of an increase in output and employment rather than in prices. Okay, now this is the short term impact of monetary policy. I'll tell you a short secret. This was also the way David Hume analyzed an increase in the money supply in an economy that traded internationally when there was an inflow of gold. That is, he talks about the farmers running more rapidly behind the plows because there is more money around to be gained by producing more output. So that the first impact of the increase in the money supply is not an increase in the price level. It's an increase in output uh, and an increase in employment. Producers will tend to react to the initial expansion in aggregate demand by increasing output, employees by working longer hours, and the unemployed by taking jobs now offered at former nominal wages. Okay. Now, that's a very key phrase here. These people were unemployed, and suddenly they're deciding to work at the wages, nominal wages that existed before. And this was supposedly the natural rate. But it describes only the initial effects because selling prices of products typically respond to an unanticipated rise in nominal demand faster than prices of factors of production. Real wages received have gone down, that is, good prices eventually go up and wages don't adjust, so that real wages are declining. Though real wages anticipated by employees went up. Remember, in the beginning, the employees looked around and said, okay, more money running around in the system, I'm going to get, I'm going to work more, and I'm going to have a, uh, a higher remuneration. Since employees implicitly evaluated the wages offered at the earlier price level. So basically what you've got here is either a trick or a mismatch in terms of expectations. The employers 
are believing that prices are going to go up so that real wages are going to go down. The workers are thinking that they're going to be working more at given wages and they've now got more employment so that real wages are going up. So indeed, the simultaneous fall ex post in real wages to employers and rise ex ante in real wages to employees is what enabled employment to increase. He's arguing here that it was a trick, okay? You had mistaken expectations. One side is expecting things to go this way. The other side is expecting things to go that way. Both of them respond. One responds by working more, you have more employment. The other responds by producing more output. And the system has this short period, uh, this short period response. But the decline in export real wages will soon come to affect anticipations. Employees will start to reckon on rising prices of the things they buy and to demand higher nominal wages for the future. Okay? Eventually, this mismatch in expectations is adjusted. And as the thing is adjusted, market unemployment is below the natural level. There's an excess demand for labor, so real wages will tend to rise towards their initial level. Even though the higher rate of monetary growth continues, the rise in real wages will reverse the decline in unemployment and then lead to a rise which will tend to return unemployment to its former level. In order to keep unemployment at its target level of 3%, the monetary authority would have to raise money growth every period by a little bit more in order to keep this divergence between the two sets of ant anticipations separate. Uh, he, he has already made this argument in terms of monetary policy, in terms of interest rates, so that we won't go to that, but he goes on to say the counterintuitive result is that all monetary policy can do is avoid causing instability by avoiding active monetary policy and unifying real and monetary representation of economic variables. And the way you do that is by doing nothing, so that you've now managed to get rid of monetary policy as an active as an active force. Now, and this was, as we say, the expectations augmented theory. Uh, many people won Nobel prizes for this particular theory. Ned Phelps is one of them. Friedman was one of them, uh, because this was considered to be the final word on the possibility of using any sort of Keynesian demand management or monetary policy to influence the level of unemployment. The level of employment was what? It was the natural rate, whatever the natural rate was. But let's look at that argument a little more closely. If after the increase in the money supply, hours worked are higher and the unemployed are accepting work, then in that, remember that previous situation was the one in which you were at the natural rate and everything was going fine. If you were at the natural rate and suddenly as a result of increasing the money supply, you have unemployed workers who are coming forward to work, you have to ask the question, what were they doing when the natural rate was at the natural rate? If they were unemployed at the natural rate, then probably this was not the natural rate. Or, if you put it this way, they must have been involuntary unemployed, but unable to work at the previously existing real and nominal wages, since prices had not changed in the initial period, and expectations had not changed from the initial period. Okay? There is involuntary unemployment when unemployment is at the natural rate. And this is, again, a contradiction in terms of your definition. The natural rate is either the natural rate in which everybody can find a job who wants a job at the currently prevailing wage, but we've just said what happened. When the money supply was increased, suddenly these people who were supposedly happy not to be working at the existing level of wages now started to work at the existing level of wages. But expectations had not changed, prices had not changed, nothing had changed. Okay. If unemployment is at the natural rate, there is no explanation of the pressure on goods prices or wages to rise until full employment is achieved, since excess demand for labor cannot exist at the natural rate. Now, it would appear that Friedman intended to argue that 
the natural rate of unemployment was equivalent to full employment. But that's not what he said. And that's not what the argument used. It's puzzling to find it put forward as a discovery that a higher inflation rate will not increase the full employment level of employment. Keynes and Keynesians would not have claimed otherwise. Okay, Has it ever been the case that a Keynesian would have argued that? No. You would not have tried to increase the rate of employment when you're already at full employment. Okay? In fact, the world described quite plainly needs no macro policy. Keynesians were concerned with the problem of pushing the economy to its natural rate, not beyond it. If the economy is there already, we could all go home. And this was the essence of what Friedman was attempting to argue. That is, yes, you can all go home. But basically, the argument was what? The argument was that the economy naturally would be at full employment, which is the point which Keynes was contesting from the beginning. And this is why I'm arguing now that the point at issue is, number one, the quantity theory and the extension of the quantity theory that, Fried that Friedman made in terms of these two, uh, these two particular articles. Um, yeah, we can just like, skip this business. So we're now at the point of looking or going back and looking at Kane, what Keynes says is the long struggle to escape from the quantity theory. Now, the quantity theory he was escaping from was not Friedman. The quantity theory that the post-Keynesians should have been escaping from, they didn't notice. And in fact, most of them ended up accepting either the basic Phillips curve adjustments or countering it simply in terms of, as we mentioned, Davidson's theory of fundamental uncertainty. Okay. Now, for me, fundamental uncertainty has never been a very telling argument. Okay. This is like saying we have, you know, we have acts of God and things can happen. Okay. You can have unemployment because things have happened. And since we at present don't have a way of convincing God what his policy should be, you end up with the same result. That is, if you believe in fundamental uncertainty, you're back in a box with Friedman, which says that really there isn't anything we can do about the fact that you don't end up with the system at full employment. Okay. Now, if we look at Keynes himself, okay, Keynes defines as his work in his struggle to escape from the quantity theory, primarily a study of the forces which determine changes in the scale of output and employment as a whole. And whilst it is found that money enters into the economic scheme in an essential and peculiar manner, technical monetary detail falls into the background. Basically saying, I did all of this in the treatise, and if you want to find out about it, go and read the, the other book. A monetary economy, which is the differentiating point between the treatise and the general theory, this idea of the monetary production economy that he produced in a paper uh, in 1933, in a feshrift for uh, Spitoff, in a monetary economy, we shall find is essentially one in which changing views about the future are capable of influencing the quantity of employment and not merely its direction, okay? And again, we mentioned yesterday the way this word direction is used. Direction is responding more, more or less to Mill's theory of gluts, okay? Direction means that employment might be in the wrong places. Employment might be producing goods that you don't need rather than goods you're doing. You say, no, it's not direction we're talking about. We're talking about the total level of unemployment because Mill accepted the existence of unemployment, but he said, you know, it's simply the problem is that, you know, you have people in the wrong places. And if you get them into the right places, you'll be back to full employment. And Keynes is, is cutting off that argument. But our method of analyzing the economic behavior of the present under the influence of changing ideas about the future is one which depends on the interaction of supply and demand and is in this way linked up with our fundamental theory of value. We are thus led to a more general theory, which includes the classical theory with which we are familiar as a special case. Okay. 
theory of value. Theory of value is what? Well, Keynes was brought up with the idea that the theory of value was micro theory. That was price theory. Supply and demand determining prices. So in the beginning of the book, in the preface to the book, he's saying it's supply and demand is the thing which allows expectations to be taken into account. Okay? So if you look at the essential theory, the essential features of that book, first, the treatment of money and prices within the theory of value. Okay? So basically what he's doing is rejecting this idea of a dichotomy between the aggregate and the micro theory, or between the real and the nominal theory, that money is essential and peculiar, but not in the direct determination of prices. It's only indirectly in terms of the determination of prices. He has to identify the forces which are determining changes in aggregate output and employment by means of the introduction of this idea of changing ideas about the future. If you look at chapter three of the general theory, those aggregate functions are what? They're aggregate price functions. They're aggregate demand price and aggregate supply price functions. When we draw, if you ever draw, that is, if you don't use the 45 degree line diagram, but if you draw an aggregate supply price and an aggregate demand price function, Keynes very quickly tells us that I can determine changes in the level of output in terms of whether the aggregate demand price is greater or less than the aggregate supply price. This sounds very much like traditional micro theory. And Keynes argues that this is what he is doing. Aggregate prices. If supply price is less than demand price, production is profitable. Just as for an individual commodity. If prices cover costs, the system is viable and expands. The point of intersection of the two functions represent equilibrium because increasing output beyond that point reduces profitability. It creates losses. Okay? So his idea of the equilibrium of the system is profit maximization. Looks very much like standard micro theory. The difference is that he's looking at it, as we said, in terms of the impact of expectations on those price functions, those aggregate supply and aggregate demand price functions. Now, if we look at Keynes' final emancipation from the quantity theory, that basically this comes only from an alternative theory of prices. Now, the alternative theory of prices are what? Well, it's one thing to say supply and demand. Paul Samuelson always used to tell a joke about becoming an economist. He said, it's not difficult to become an economist. I have a parrot at home that I can teach to say supply and demand. So the point is not simply supply and demand. It's what's underneath the supply and what's underneath the demand. Okay, And again, it's just a parallel comment. If you think of the conjunction that I mentioned between the Strapian approach to prices and the post-Keynesian approach that we looked at as part of the uh, evolution of post-Keynesian theory, okay, traditional price theory was what? Well, Strapian argued against traditional Marshallian price theory because, first of all, the concept of liquid, liquid sorry, utility was completely ephemeral. It had no basic identifiable base. It wasn't something that could form part of a scientific theory. On the other hand, his analysis of production was based on the criticism that if you looked at the curve that was designed for firms' costs, the firm's cost curve was a combination well, you have the cost curve that goes down and it reaches a minimum and then it goes up. Well, why does it go down and why does it go up? Well, one side is economies of scale and the other side is diminishing returns. 
And Safa said, it's, it's inconsistent to have a theory of costs that are determined by two different explanations of how costs evolve when output changes. So if you look at it that way, Keynes is also rejecting the traditional explanation of supply and demand in terms of maximizing consumer utility or maximizing profitability in terms of the relationship between marginal cost and marginal revenue. It's a very interesting antidote, anecdote which circulated when I was a student in Cambridge and eventually came out in the uh, collected papers. Keynes was asked to by Macmillan, the publisher, to uh, do an evaluation of Jones Robinson, John Robinson's book on imperfect competition. And he wrote back and he said, well, you know, this really is not very interesting to me. I can't see that this has any basic contribution to make uh, to economic theory. It's very interesting. It's well done. But, you know, I have no, I have no use for these, these sorts of things. So you're looking for a differentiation, a different way to present the determination of those prices, okay? Now, if we think of those rates of return, okay, those rates of return that exist for investment projects are always expressing current prices, spot prices, which can be identified in the market, and forward prices, which are based on expectations, which is the way he says, bringing expectations of the future into the calculation. That is, we're not simply talking about the determination of Marshall's market prices. But what we're also doing is effectively creating an explanation of, number one, how output and employment change over time. Remember the beginning of the preface. He said, this is what I'm now trying to do. So... I can identify the gap between those spot and forward prices as being profitable or not profitable, determining whether I decide to change investment or output or employment levels, okay? So if you have profitability, yes, the system is expanding. If you don't, it doesn't. And at the same time, what is going to be happening? Well, what's going to be happening is that as output changes, you're going to be having changes in this relationship between spot and forward prices, and you're going to have changes in expectations. Okay, We know that the Swedish economists developed this idea of ex ante and ex post. Okay? And the argument was we could understand the general theory in terms of ex ante expectations relative to ex post expectations. In his lectures after the publication of the general theory, he makes a very strong comment in which he says, well, that's a very interesting idea, but that's not really what I had in mind. Why? Well, he says, if you have an ex ante, ex, or sorry, if you have an ex ante expectation and you compare it to the ex post expectation, if it turns out to be correct, that's fine. Probably you have no incentive to change. But if it's not correct, why would you keep those ex ante expectations? You're going to change them. And you're going to change them by doing what? By changing output and employment. And that is going to have an impact on what? on current spot prices and your expectation of forward prices. So it's this constellation of those two prices and the necessity of the entrepreneur always to try and produce a condition in which the combination of those two prices is profitable, which is going to explain the evolution of the system. Now, those two prices are what? Well, as we said, that's just the interest rate, okay? So that if we have a theory of prices, the theory of prices is obviously going to be one that is linked to the rate of interest, okay? So the question now depends, what is going to be the rate of interest, which is going to be the one that has the influence or the impact on the system? Well, Fisher had already 
in the end, well, in 1890, what, appreciation and interest, which dates, I think, from 1898, had already pointed out that money was not unique in having a rate of interest. That is, every commodity has a rate of interest. There is a rate of interest for wheat, depending on the amount of wheat you can buy spot and the amount of wheat you can buy forward. Corn, bananas, hula hoops, whatever you like. Fisher said there are an infinite number of the rate of interest possible. And he then went on to say, not only is there an inf are there an infinite number of rates of interest for commodities possible, but there are an infinite number of time periods. Okay, I can have an int wheat interest rate for one year, two years, three years, four years, five years. And then he took the step further and he said, well, I can even have an interest rate for wheat when I acquire wheat in three years time and sell it in five years time. Okay, how many people are working in financial markets? You know about forward interest rates? The forward rate curve, Fisher invented this in 1896 or 1898, okay? Keynes did the same thing in terms of what he called the own rates of interest, which is a concept that he took from Sraffa. Own rates of interest are what? Well, they're the same thing that Fisher identified as commodity rates of interest. The own rate of interest on wheat is how much wheat you have today relative to how much wheat you have tomorrow as a proportion of the wheat you started out with. An arithmetical decision, okay? So now, if you think of Keynes trying to design a system which pushes towards full employment, how would you do this? And he said, well, really what you want to do is to create a profit incentive in terms of the spot and forward prices for future output. He identifies in the treatise something which he calls backwardation. Backwardation is what? Backwardation is a financial futures market concept which relates to the relation of spot relative to forward prices. If they produce a profit, if expectations are such that they produce a profit, you have what is called backwardation. And Keynes says, if I manage to introduce backwardations into the system, then entrepreneurs are going to want to expand. They're going to engage in the spot market to buy inputs in order to produce outputs that they can sell at the forward price. Okay? So your ideal policy is one which doesn't necessarily influence the aggregate flow of government expenditure or of effective demand. It's interesting, if you look in the general theory, there's hardly any mention of fiscal policy. The policy that Keynes promotes is a policy to get prices in the appropriate relationship of backwardation so that the private sector has the incentive to expand output and employment. Okay? Now, that's the part of the theory in which he says, I can explain how the theory, you know, the part that I didn't have in the treatise, I didn't have the movement, I didn't explain the dynamic of the system. It's the prices that explain the dynamic of the system. Okay? Now, the piece of the equation is what? What is going to be the end point of that expansion? Is it going to be full employment? And this is where liquidity preference comes in. You have a multiple, and this, if you read chapter 17, chapter 17, you have a multiple range of investment opportunities. And if you like, you can, you, know, you can expand those investment opportunities to consumption opportunities, or at least for durable consumption goods, you can do it. Okay? And you can say, as the system expands, what's going to happen? Well, the entrepreneurs are going to invest in those areas where backwardation produces the greatest profitability. What's going to happen is you expand in those sectors. 
Well, Keynes was an old-fashioned believer in diminishing returns. Not necessarily physical diminishing returns, but market diminishing returns. That is, as you expand in each one of those individual investment areas, profitability is going to be falling. And eventually it's going to fall until what happens? Well, until it's below the next most profitable opportunity. So if you read through chapter 17, the chapter the analysis of story analysis of chapter 17 is that the entrepreneurs are there chasing through these various investments, always looking for the one that's most profitable, pushing them all down. Okay, so that the rates of profit and all of these investments are falling, 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 falling. Where do they stop? Well, he said, if you look at this system of multiple rates of interest, Fisher had already explained to us that for the system to reach an equilibrium, one of these rates, well, to be precise, it's not for the system to reach equilibrium, to be able to calculate the rates, okay? You had to have a single unit of account to compare those rates of return in that single unit of account. And okay, you had to have one rate which is given, the peg at which you compare all of the others. Keynes looks at this and he said, okay, the unit of account is money and the rate on money is going to be determined by what? It's going to be determined by liquidity preference. Liquidity preference is my explanation. Now, as he said, what happens is that as the system expands, all these rates of return are falling, and eventually what happens? Well, he said, eventually what happens is that it gets blocked. It stops. Because why? Because the rate of return on money refuses to fall when people decide to invest in more money. Okay. He said, if you look at it this way, you've got all of these commodities, their rates of profit are falling. You get down to the rate of interest on money. And say people say, well, I don't want to invest any more in wheat. Money is paying me a higher interest rate. I'm going to invest in money. Now, what should happen then is that the rate of return on money should go down. But Keynes says it doesn't. Why? It doesn't because of what he calls the liquidity premium. What is the liquidity premium? Well, the liquidity premium, if we look very carefully, comes in terms of Keynes' discovery of the concept of duration. Duration is what? Well, duration is a concept which we now use in financial markets quite generally, and Keynes' time it had not yet been formulated. If you look in the general theory, there's this discussion of the risks of a decline in the rate of interest to holders of long-term indebtedness. He picks out the rate 4%. He says, if you're holding a long-term bond, okay, and the coupon rate on that long-term bond is 4%, If the interest rate falls from 4%, that's fine. Capital gain on the bond. Price of the bond goes up. You're happy. On the other hand, if the interest rate rises, then there's a capital loss. And that capital loss in the decision to hold the bond has to be compared to the yield on the bond. So the yield on the bond is what? The 4% coupon, okay? And he points out that if the rise in the rate of interest at 4% is greater than the square of the interest rate, that is greater than 4%, the capital loss is greater than the yield on the bond. That is, you end up taking a loss. And he argues that if that is the case, if expectations of future interest rates moving upwards rather than downwards creates the greater risk of loss relative to the running yield, which says that you should no longer be holding, holding bonds. Okay? And he says at this point, monetary policy okay, becomes difficult 
to operate. Why? Because people are saying, no, I'm simply not going to trade with you in the market anymore. I'm not trading with the central bank. What you want to do is to come in and if you're trying to come in and influence the interest rate, you want to increase the money supply, it won't work. It won't work. Why? Because people are willing to take as much money as you're willing to give them without a change in the interest rate. Why? Because money, by definition, doesn't have a capital loss. The money relative to the bond has no capital loss. So King's argument is that, well, if we look at this now, here is Friedman and his central bank coming in and trying to flood the system with money. And Keynes is saying, well, you know, there may be cases in which increases in the quantity of money to have no impact at all on financial asset prices. And if they have no impact on financial asset prices, they don't have an impact on spot forward prices, and they will have no impact on conditions in the in the real market. Okay, So this is the story which he tells us of his price theory. And it's interesting, as I said before, if you look at fiscal policy, no, Keynes was not very, very much of supportive of deficit government spending. His fiscal policy was what? His fiscal policy was to influence spot and forward prices. So yes, if you had a glut, okay, if spot prices were very low, so that traders in the market might think, well, if prices are falling, I'm better off going short than to buying up the surplus. There was a role for government to intervene, buffer stocks. If you intervene to buy up the excess surplus, you were increasing the spot price and you were trying to recreate the profitability of continuing to produce. The problem with having a glut or excess stocks is that it doesn't pay. There's no profit in producing. You go in the other direction. And this was the argument that you had in terms of fiscal policy. Fiscal policy was to have an impact on spot and forward prices rather than simply having an impact on incomes. Okay? It's interesting that the theory that we normally use, am I forgetting my policy? Yeah, we're still here. The policy that we normally use is to say, well, all of this works through the magic of the multiplier. Okay? And we're well aware of our circular flows and our hydraulic multipliers and everything else. At a uh, conference in Paris at the celebration, I think it was the 100th anniversary of the general theory, I produced a paper in which I said, the multiplier okay, is not a hydraulic system. Okay? It's not simply where you push in the money and it pushes out at the other end. In order for the multiplier to work, what has to happen? Well, if the multiplier is going to work, the increase in government expenditures has to have an impact on current prices. It has to have an impact on future expectations. And it's the creation of the profitability between spot and forward prices that generates the impetus that is behind the multiplier. This is why people are willing or why people are not willing to simply take the money and stick it in their pocket, okay? Because the multiplier depends on people having to save a bit and to consume a bit. But if there is no expectation of future profitability, the government can spend as much as it wants. If everybody decides to stick it in their pocket and keep it, the multiplier doesn't work. So again, this I, entire concept of the multiplier exists because of this underlying, what I would underlie, underlying price theory. Now, the yeah, we've done this, uh, that liquidity preference is the place that, or the area, and this is why Minsky calls this the, the theory of financial prices. I would call it the theory of all prices, because virtually every decision that is made in terms of expenditure has a spot and a forward element. Okay, In terms of investment, they're more uh, evident. In terms of inflation, Okay, if you have inflation, what happens? 
Well, inflation is a distortion of spot relative to forward prices. If you've lived in high levels of inflation, I started out my career uh, living in England when inflation rates got up around 20, 24, 25%. This is a substantial, not the Brazilian level, but this is substantial. So you do start thinking about your consumption expenditures in terms of spot and forward prices. So you now if you go to the uh, to the shop and you're buying something today, you buy enough for well, you buy enough to eat today. But if you expect prices to be rising by 20 percent, you may buy enough for the next week or the next two weeks or the next three weeks. OK, implicitly, you have a spot in a forward price and you end up generating a profit in terms of the storage, and you simply compare the storage with the cost of committing finance to that element. And if it turns out that you earn more by buying in terms of stock, then you do that. Okay. Now, what happens when that occurs? What's, it's an incentive to increase prices. Okay, because it increases present prices relative to demand, it creates a non-normal expansion in demand, and it pushes up spot prices, and this then creates a change in expectations in which people expect future expectations to rise by more, and you end up with an inflationary spiral. Could be wages. Well, yeah, it could be wages. But if you look at the application of this sort of approach to all sorts of expenditures, okay, you very quickly find alternative explanations to inflation other than simply saying, well, those workers want too much money. And it's too much money to the workers, which is causing the inflation. It's not the excess demand. It's the problem in the relationship between the spot and the forward prices. Now, I'm going to go very quickly to look at the, re the discussions that went on between Hugh Townsend, because this is where you, you get this last sort of you know, sealing uh, the argument in terms of uh, the quantity theory. If it was not completely obvious to early readers of the general theory, in particular chapter 17, such as Hicks and Hansen, Samuelson and Company, appeared perfectly obvious to, to, to Hugh Townsend in 1937. Thus, it would seem that Mr. Keynes doctrine of liquidity preference really involves a generalization of the classical theory of value. For the practical difference between the generalized and the classical theory of value is on the view suggested. Most important in the case of monetary assets, especially long-term ones, to the causal determination to the price of which marginal production theory is hardly applicable at all. Quite material in the case of durable goods, of low elasticities of production and substitution, and negligible in the case of services and of goods of short life easy substitutability or easy to produce with relatively small employment of labor. So here you have towns, as I said before, I don't invent any of this stuff. I just know how to read. Nevertheless, it would seem that it is essential to take liquidity into account in order to discuss any money prices. For even if certain assets have so little liquidity premium, the changes in it do not affect their monetary prices, variations in the large liquidity premium of money will do so, operating, of course, on the conditions of new production of the assets. Okay, so this is Townsend extend, extending this theory now to all levels. Thus, the volume of money is not directly and uh, not a directly determining factor of prices, nor of any prices by an obvious extension of the argument. Limitations, whatever they may be, of the stock of money cannot suffice to prevent expectations from raising or lowering the money prices of all durable goods and assets, not, of course, equally without limit of speed. That is to say, to an arbitrary extent, even in the shortest period. Okay. 
So basically what he's saying, remember, you know, if you look back at the, the, what we read in the preface, you know, the, the importance of taking in expectations of the future on the present. Well, everybody says, yeah, the future is uncertain. I have to know how to decide this or everything else. No, what he's talking about are these circular loops that can set up with expectations. So that in this particular case, he said, okay, money supply can go up, money supply can go down. The impact on prices is going to be determined by the relationship between spot and forward prices. If the expectation is that spot prices are going to fall, prices are probably going to continue to fall. If the expectation is that spot prices are going to rise relative to forward prices, they're probably going to continue to rise independently of the stock of money. Even in the case, he said, if the stock of money doesn't change and suddenly you have, well, you have a war in Europe and you have sanctions and you have embargoes and you have changes in the prices of energy, what happens? Okay. Was it the change in the quantity of money that produced those changes in prices? No, it was a change in the expectations of the forward prices of those commodities. And that change in the expectation of forward prices fed back into the spot prices. Okay, if you expect forward prices to be rising by more than X percent, and that's greater than the rate of interest, it pays you to do what? To go into the spot market and buy in the spot market, and that's going to push up spot prices. If it pushes up spot prices, you look and say, oh, my expectation was that the prices forward were going to raise by 15 percent. Now we see that spot prices have already gone up by 10. I should revise my forward prices by 10%. And you get into this very famous inflationary spiral. Now, the function of the rate of interest is to modify the money prices of other capital assets in such a way as to equalize the attraction of holding them and holding cash. Where does the interest rate come in? It comes in in telling you whether these what are effectively arbitrage operations are profitable or not. Why? Because you're always comparing them to do what? To holding money. And holding money gives you a return, which is either the interest rate on the short-term bond you're holding, or in the case of falling prices, in the case of losses on the money that you get. Okay. So if you get the final conclusion, if Mr. Keynes' views be accepted, it will seem that the consideration governing the prices of monetary assets must also pro tanto apply to determining the prices of other durable assets. For the latter figure, as Mr. Keynes puts it, if monetary attributes are of a varying degree, a kind of liquidity premium attaches to them also. Okay. Now, at one point, a good friend of mine, Jeff Harcourt, because I've been pushing this theory for what, 30 years, uh, they said this is the what we would now call the hedge fund manager interpretation of the general theory, or what Harcourt called it, the Cambridge Bursar's analysis of the general theory. But if you think of the standard I won't say standard. If you think of the active hedge fund manager, okay, the active hedge fund manager is doing what? Everything he looks at is identified in terms of the liquidity premium and in terms of the embedded options that are in it. Okay, He's always looking at the disposition of his capital relative to making the highest rate of return. We think back to the the period of Chernobyl, I was living in Italy in that period, the reactor explodes, what happens? Well, we see the cloud coming over northern Italy, I dive underneath my, my desk, and we sit there with the curtains drawn and everything else, we think we're going to be killed by the radiation. At that time I was working with a uh, major investment bank in New York, the guy calls me up, I'm there under the desk, 
I say, okay, you know, this is what's happening here, what's happening there. And I said, you know, what sort of positions are you taking? Well, you know, we're in potatoes. I'm going, potatoes? I said, yeah, they produce a lot of tomato potatoes in Belarus and in Ukraine. And all of those potatoes cannot be sold. Spot price of potatoes is going to go through the roof. Forward price is going to go through the roof. We're buying every potato we can find. Okay, so this is this is the example of chapter 17. All of those own rates of interest, all of them are potatoes. Well, they're not all potatoes. Some are automobile plants. Some are electrical generating plants. Some are, but they're all investments that are producing employment. So this is the, the concept that you get in the system. And this is the importance that you had, about well, the importance of getting out from underneath the quantity theory. Why? Well, the alternative to that story is what? Well, remember, we have things, the Pigou effect, all right? We have also the Leontief effect. There's a story that circulates when Leontief started teaching at Harvard. He would stand, so he taught the introductory course. He would stand in front of the class. He would take out a, a dime, a 10 cent piece, and he would hold it up. And he would say, with this dime, I can buy everything that can be produced in this country. Everybody would look at him and say, well, no, that's impossible. He said, well, it is possible. All I have to do is to get prices down far enough. Okay. What's the problem with that story? The problem with that story is the fact that what is he doing? He's looking at what? Only prices today. He's not looking at forward prices, and he's not looking at, as Cadence kept saying, long-term assets. Okay, what happens if you're a long-term asset holder or a long-term borrower? Okay, when prices go down, ooh, you have a problem if you're a borrower, because the real value of your debt, well, the real value of your debt drives you bankrupt right away. So you may be able to buy everything that can be produced, but there are no producers who are still capable of surviving in a system like that. Okay. So the problem is, and the key to all of this, is that Keynes gets onto this, this idea when he looks at Fisher's explanation of what we call the Fisher Principle. That is basically that change in the quantity of money produces inflation, produces a change in the interest rate. And he said, no that doesn't work, or it only works if you don't have long-term bondholders. If you've got long-term bondholders, implicitly the adjustment of the interest rate produces a capital loss, which more than offsets or can more than offset, okay? The increase in the interest rate to compensate for the inflation. And basically his argument is that there's no way that you can compensate for inflation as long as you have a system where you have financing with long-term capital instruments because you have to take into account those, those particular gains and losses. Okay, so that's the, the, yeah, well, this is the beginning of the, or, sorry, the end of this story. There is a, uh, an explanation which exists in the rest of chapter 17, in which he makes this long, complicated argument about the essential properties of money, which just drive people crazy because they don't understand why it's there. Basically, all he's attempting to do is to say that when you've pushed all those rates of return down to that lowest level and the money rate of return is the highest, why is it that people deciding to hold money to earn that rate of return don't continue to push the interest rate down until you get to full employment, okay? And basically his argument is in terms of these uh, elasticities of production and substitution, and that's why they're there. And secondly, now in very simple terms, he does this in terms of hoarding. He says basically if people, and that's where the duration argument comes in, if people are willing to hold as much money as you can give them at the given interest rate because you're afraid of the capital losses that you get from investing in, uh, in fixed interest obligations, 
then the system is always going to come to a stop. So this is this argument about the rate of interest ruling the roost. Why is the rate of interest the one that's most important? Is because, well, if you like, diminishing returns doesn't work in terms of money. Or if you look in terms of the money relationship, you're always in the position, well, you're not always in the position where the forward is above the spot. There are passages in the general theory where he talks about negative interest rates. He said you can have spot rates that are below uh, spot, rate, spot rates, but this is not what, he, what you, we normally consider the normal, uh, the normal state of affairs. Or it wasn't until Germany in the 1960s, if I remember, introduced the Bard Bowl, which was the equivalent of a negative interest rate on uh, money holdings. Now, the, yeah, the last uh, point to take into account in this discussion of what's in the, in the general theory, how am I doing for time, Alicia? We're okay? Okay, we'll just pick this one and finish it. Uh, and this is the discussion of wages, okay? And we know that there is a large, uh, there was a lot of criticism of Keynes' theory that it only worked because wages were given or that wages were very slow to adjust. Instead, Keynes makes the argument of wage stability in terms of the liquidity premium and the fact that wages being, the term, being determined in terms of money, okay, that the uh, liquidity preference on money will create the incentive for wages to remain more stable than most other, uh, most other commodities. And if you look down at the bottom, there's a, uh, a passage that comes from Townsend. Uh, so long as wage earners are not allowed to own slaves by their, uh, to be owned as slaves by their employers, labor carries no liquidity premium at all. Its money value is not liable to be disturbed by psychological changes in liquidity premiums. So he's arguing that this is a separate, uh, the determination of the return to labor power is a separate, uh, separate type of argument. Okay, so this is basically the argument that, that, uh, that I wanted to present as the background, because eventually we want to talk about the way you do financing of investment. Now, if you do financing of investment, the first thing you have to do is to discover how the decisions to take investment are linked to the financial sector. And here, what Keynes provides is saying, yes, you have this direct determination which comes from expectations and the rate of interest through liquidity preference. Now, the last point is that Keynes never defines a physical representation of money. Okay, in chapter 17, he says, well, you know, there are physical monies, but virtually anything can satisfy the conditions that its liquidity premium is greater than its carrying cost. Okay, it doesn't necessarily have to be a physical thing. He even says land, in some cases, could satisfy these conditions. So the end of the story is that, as we said, not only does escaping from the quantity theory mean that money doesn't directly influence prices, but it means that it's not money in and of itself which provides the constraint. It's the liquidity preference that financial markets and individuals hold informing their expectations of that liquidity premium because that's what competes with all of the other investments in the, in the system. So this has to be the background that we use in evaluating. Now we say, okay, we want to, you know, I want to finance a new mine somewhere. Well, I need money. I need gold. I'll dig the gold mine and the gold is going to finance it. Ken says, no, that's not the way the system functions. That's not the way it works. Okay. You can create the financing if you manage, again, to get the spot and forward prices appropriately aligned and you get liquidity premium appropriately aligned so that the interest rates are appropriate. But we'll talk more about that later, uh, later this afternoon. Okay. Thank you. How did we do here? Oh, well, it's not too bad.
este, en español o en inglés. Sí. Okay. Okay. Este, bueno, eh, buenas tardes. Pues la verdad es que eh, pues un impresionante presentación del doctor Kregel sobre esto. Vemos que es una cuestión teórica, ¿no? Lo que está discutiendo al final es la teoría de los precios y cómo esta teoría dentro del enfoque ortodoxo pues ha sido mal abordada, ¿no? Sabemos que un sistema teórico que aspire a explicar una realidad, pues tiene que ser completo, tiene que ser no redundante, los supuestos tienen que ser este, unos, unos llevarnos mediante lógica deductiva a conclusiones. Y parece ser que la teoría ortodoxa, pues en realidad lo que, lo que se ha hecho es que se le ha ido agregando cosas, ¿no? Entonces, por ejemplo, estamos bien conscientes de que el, la parte más este, que todos conocemos de, de teoría económica, el modelo de Higgs, pues se le agregó, lo que menciona el doctor, se le agregó la ecuación de demanda de dinero y con eso se, se reemplazó completamente la teoría de la preferencia por la liquidez, ¿no? Que, de la forma como Keynes lo veía en la teoría general del dinero, en, la teor en su teoría general. Entonces, al final estamos viendo que la teoría ortodoxa se ha ido construyendo de manera... Este, pues agregándole cuestiones para hacer, este, para llegar a que esa teoría sea como una, una explicación real de la realidad de, de la realidad económica, una buena explicación de la realidad económica y sus supuestos son inconsistentes, ¿no? Este, algo que me gustaría a mí detallar muy rápido sobre, sobre lo que más hizo énfasis el doctor es este supuesto que, que tiene la teoría ortodoxa donde hay una dicotomía ¿no? entre el sector real y el sector monetario, ¿no? El sector financiero en, el, en la teoría y que en realidad es una, es una forma inconsistente de interpretar la realidad y que Keynes veía como el supuesto real que debería de haberse tomado sobre la cuestión del dinero es que no están, no están desligadas, no hay esa dicotomía entre el sector financiero y el sector real y esta, este supuesto muy básico que está mencionando él que venía en Keynes y que es que la teoría la teoría que tiene que ver con la cuestión financiera estaría basada en un supuesto en que la relación entre los precios presentes y los precios futuros es lo que realmente este, determina la, la tasa, este, está determinada por la tasa de interés y que al final del día esto, este, ignorar este supuesto tan fundamental hizo que se malentendiera la forma como la política fiscal debe de funcionar. Todos pensamos que la política fiscal es gastar, el gobierno gasta y tiene un déficit, ¿no? Y el déficit va a hacer que haya crecimiento económico. Pues no es lo que efectivamente Keynes tenía en mente tal cual, sino que él estaba esperando que la política fiscal tuviera una influencia en crear condiciones para que la relación entre los precios presentes y los precios futuros que observan los productores, ¿verdad? La, la, los empresarios, este, permitiera que ellos este, esas condiciones la política fiscal generaría las condiciones para que los empresarios puedan invertir, dado que ellos siempre están observando las relaciones entre precios presentes precios futuros y si es rentable esa, 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 esa relación entre esos precios, ellos invierten entonces la política fiscal se basa en generar esas condiciones y las genera a través bueno, pues, de instrumentos como el déficit o el, o el gasto pero no es tal cual como se interpretó en el enfoque de Higgs, ¿no? en ese que todos conocemos, la cruz, eh, ese modelo donde simplemente le agregamos la demanda de dinero, y la, la, la función de demanda de dinero es la teoría de la preferencia por la liquidez de manera muy simplista, y que en realidad, pues bueno, eso ha terminado en que en, pues un, un manejo inapropiado de un modelo con supuestos este, que no son creíbles y que al final del día pues nos llevan a... a propuestas de política fiscal y política monetaria, manejos de política fiscal y política monetaria que no son consistentes para poder realmente atacar la inflación. Si no entendemos, si no tenemos una teoría clara de los precios, o sea, una teoría del valor, ¿no? una teoría consistente asociada a, a la cuestión financiera, que no están separadas, entonces al final, pues bueno, vamos a tener conclusiones de política monetaria y fiscal que, eh, que hemos visto que en los últimos 30, 40 años, pues no han sido exitosos, ¿no? Entonces, eh, 
con estos comentarios yo creo que no, no soy un experto en la parte de, de, de teoría este, del valor, pero me parece que, que efectivamente el doctor Kregel es un experto en esta parte, y conoce muy bien las teorías y puede eh, llevarnos a esta conclusión, ¿no? donde es bien importante pensar que, que la relación entre los precios futuros y los precios actuales es, determin, está determinada por la tasa de interés y que los empresarios observan eso y eso tendría que conducir a una política fiscal diferente a la que llevamos a cabo ahora en todos los países en el mundo. ¿no? Y todas esas, estas falacias de, eh, de relaciones que aceptamos como, como hechos, ¿no? este, eh, como supuestos de los modelos, como la, la relación que establece la curva de Phillips o la, o la teoría de, de, de interés de Fisher, ¿no? Entonces, bueno, este, este, esto sería como algo de lo que, con lo que yo me quedo. Eh, como ya mencioné, no soy un experto en teoría económica, pero es lo que, lo que me llamó la atención y que creo que sería importante. Me gustaría a mí hacerle tre tres preguntas al, al doctor Kregel este, y también esperar este, reacciones de, del público presente y también del, de la gente que nos está viendo en, 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 en el YouTube. Este, eh, voy a plantear las tres preguntas ahorita al doctor y posteriormente pues, este, estaremos levantando algunas preguntas del público y, y, y con eso estaríamos cerrando. Este, bueno, eh, thank you for the presentation. It was, it was really good presentation. I, I love it. Um, as, eh, as far as I understand, I am not an expert in economic theory, but, but I'm, I'm going to... Uh, An important assumption in, in kindness is some kind of uh, the, the relationship between pre, the spot, pre, spot prices and future prices is a really uh, important assumption, of the theory. And that even uh, leads us to, to a different way of thinking about the fiscal policy. Um, can we think about this relation as a kind of So substitutability between expectations, present and future expectations, substitutability is a relation, can be thought in that, in that sense in order to define it. Uh, so I have a, a substitutability between present and, and future um, prices so that we can define that in, in, in the theory as an assumption or something. That would be a question. Uh, the second question I have is uh, um, how, uh, given the, the current inflation we are living uh, uh, at this time, that many explain as a result of the war or, or the COVID and all that um, shock, exogenous shocks, how could you use this interpretation uh, to explain the current inflation we have? That would be a second question. And uh, my third question would be, um, what are the prospects for the post-Kinesian theory in the current discussion at the worldwide level? I have seen that uh, uh, not, it's kind of difficult to, to fight against the orthodox uh, thinking. So I would like to, to see your impression. What are the prospects? Uh, that, that graph that you presented at the very beginning in which uh, you can compare uh, how the post are are a, a read for most of, peop most of the people. So what, what are your, your prospects? Because I think that if we don't uh, have discussions like this, the, the theory cannot evolve and have a better interpretation, better uh, theories to interpret, to, to have a, a, meaning, a meaningful uh, policy theory in, to, to, to face uh, these problems. Uh, could you uh, maybe re give a, a, re a response on this? And then we will skip to some questions from, for, from the people. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Armando. Mm -hmm. the, the first point is a very interesting one because really what what it does is recalls Fisher and his approach to the thing. As we know, Fisher thought he was inventing a new theory of interest when he was writing. And he called this the time preference and the investment opportunity theory. Mm. And time preference looks very much like 
liquidity preference. And mm -hmm. one of the, uh, what should I say, one, one of the, um, what should I say, attractive things which I use when I do the uh, presentation in courses with this is to try and show how close Fisher and Keynes were in the beginning mm -hmm. when they started out their, uh, their theories. Now, the Fisher's time preference eventually came, it comes not only as the, shall we say, the consumption side, because he talks about the allocation of consumption over time and this being uh, created as a, uh, uh, an equilibrium process balancing the distribution of income, but also in terms of investment. And this is how he gets to the forward rates. Mm -hmm. Because when he's talking about investment opportunity, basically, in difference from Keynes, although the, the concepts are exactly the same, uh, Keynes is always talking about, do I hold money or do I hold some financial asset? This is Tobin's famous money and bonds, which caused so much problem because it forgot about all of the other things besides bonds. Well, what Fisher was saying is that really what we should be looking at, and this is basically what you find now in the corporate finance books today, is that an investor looking at an investment project really has to look and say, well, maybe for the first two years, I want to invest in this. And in the next three years, I want to invest in that. And in the next five years, I want to invest in something else. So Fisher's calculation of rate of return over cost was simply the calculation of saying, relative to the interest rate, do I get a higher return by going from A to B to C? And this is determined by what? Well, this is again a time preference. It's not a time preference in terms of consumption, but it's your time preference in terms of your income flows or your monetary flows. So exactly, there is this uh, relationship between the expectations that you have for those periods and the decisions and the prices that you're going to be putting on those. Because those forward rates are what? Well, the forward rates don't do anything except, I mean, the way you calculate the forward rates is by bootstrapping up from the current short-term rate. So that by doing that, you're simply calculating what the market currently expects for mm -hmm. expectations on those future in those future periods. So in fact, yeah, what you're doing is mm -hmm. substituting or substituting expectations, uh, expectations back and forth. If we look at the current inflation, the, uh, you see the, the standard, as I mentioned before, even one of the standard approaches within post-Keynesian theory is markup pricing. Basically, you know, you simply look, you use a Koleskian markup or a uh, uh, degree of monopoly, which was also very, very popular when Keynes was writing. None of these things, which he looked at very closely. Uh, and they provide us with a very simple sort of adding up explanation which is similar to the one you find in Adam Smith in terms of the components of price. So if you accept the idea of the components of price, okay, you automatically are led to looking at indivi these individual items in price components. Now, which is the largest individual item in the price components? Well, almost always it turns out to be wages. So that by definition, now you've set up the problem in order to identify wages as probably the causal mechanism of the inflation. Now, that is not justifiable. That is, there's no causal explanation there. It's simply the way you've set up the theoretical explanation of how prices are determined and how prices change. So if you look at this in a different way, and again, this is the idea that all of these things are more or less uh, current prices. If you look at it in terms of expectations, it forces you to go to a slightly different uh, perspective. And that perspective is, first of all, looking at what are the incentives for individuals to take action on individual sets of prices. Now, as it's very interesting, this, uh, the quotation from Townsend, he says, you know, wage earners can't become slaves. They don't get sold mm -hmm. in the market. They don't get liquidity preference. So 
this explanation that we have can't explain wages. Okay, because we don't have spot forward prices for wages, we don't, you know, we can't sell the labor back and forth. We still do have expectations of what future wages are going to be relative mm -hmm. to current wages, but it's not the same, the same sort of uh, the same sort of argument that you could use in terms uh, in terms of arguments. So you you first have that distinction between the contribution that will come from inflation, from wages, and from other. Uh, from other items. It's very interesting. If you look, Marshall was the first one, I think, who identified the, the very clearly identified the labor market as being something that was different from commodity markets. Mm -hmm. Now, he said, if you, if you don't use the printing press, well, the printing press just sits there. It doesn't feel bad. It doesn't starve. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, go out and protest in the streets. Labor, on the other hand, does have a bottom, a subsistence wage, mm -hmm. which you cannot transgress without getting into difficulty. So that's the, the first point. The second point is that if you follow the sort of Straffian line in terms of spot forward prices, if you think of this idea of Straffian's prices of production, basically prices of production are determined by saying, what do we need in order to be able to re repeat this process? Okay, what are the prices of the inputs that are necessary in order to allow me to produce, sell the output at current prices, and then start that process over again? So you start with this spot forward thing. Okay, you start with the presumption that entrepreneurs are there, yes, to make a profit, but it's not only to make a profit this week or this year, but they believe that they're going to be in business for a substantial period of time. So you're looking at the prices, spot and forward prices and expectations of a whole range of inputs and the way all of those inputs interact with other inputs, okay? Now, eventually, Strapa produces this thing called joint product. Joint products are a much more complicated way of doing this, but if you follow that, Again, you're led away from simply this component's idea of saying, okay, the inflation was caused by this thing. You know, oil prices went up by 20%. No, the problem is that oil prices not only went up by 20%, the expectation that the war was going to be over in 10 minutes or the war was going to be over in 10 years is going to have a very, very <laughs> strong okay. impact on the way expectations are going to be formed. And then you've got the problem that energy prices are a basic in mm. terms, okay? They enter into the production of virtually every other commodity. So that you start out by saying, okay, that has the, but if you want to do this appropriately, and this, when I say I worked for some, uh, for some time, uh, running the, uh, the study center of the Italian industrials, Compindustria combination. And this was in a period when Italy was going under close to hyperinflation, when people were getting shot in the streets. We were all on the, the list of the Brigate Rosse and everything else. First thing we did is we set up an input-output table. Mm -hmm. And through the input-output, we said, okay, if we know that now the oil market, the energy market is going to have this sort of configuration so that you have the likelihood that you're going to need an adjustment of prices of this amount to satisfy expectations. If you look at the input output table, the input output is going to, table is going to tell you what do all of these other sectors need in order to be able to cover those prices in terms of selling their output in order to keep producing at either their current level or what they expect to be the level going forward. Okay, and this gives you, as I say, a much more complex way of looking at uh, at the the, uh, the inflation problem. And you can then say, well, okay, it's not necessarily the case that the intervention that you want to stop the inflation is well simply this bludgeon, which is raising interest rates or running a budget surplus, which means that you're just ignoring all of this information that you have in the system rather than using it. So if you want to use it, you can say, okay, we can use specific 
interventions. Okay, if we have, if we know, say for example, we have the health sector. The health sector has this dependence on energy. We want to maintain output and performance in the health sector so that in order for them to get, we may want to put a subsidy on energy purchased through the, through the health sector rather than acting directly in terms of energy markets or things like that. Anyway, as you, know, as I, as, as you try to say, this gives you a, a, a different framework, a different <coughs> context in which to look at the way these things work. Uh, for the last question, the well, I don't know. This is, like I say, the, from you know, from the way this title started out, you can see that I'm not very optimistic about um, about this this particular approach to the theory going forward. Uh, one of the things which I try to emphasize is that Keynes' theory was really very conservative, in the sense. I mean, it was it it has uh, affinity with certain parts of Marxian theory, but it also has very basic differences with that. It has affinities with Fisher's theory and it has basic differences. And if you look uh, in the end, what Fisher was arguing was that, again, through this argument, this comparison of interest rates is that eventually people would be arbitraging across different areas and you would end up with full employment. And the difference was that Keynes you know, substituted liquidity preference for time preference and he ended up with an arbitrage that converged at less than full employment. Mm. But the mechanism is really very similar. I mean, it's not, it's not, mm. it's not that this is a, uh, what do I say? This is not an anti-market approach or an anti-capitalist approach or a planning approach that you're trying to do. You're trying to say, I'm trying to understand how capitalism works and I'm trying to fix it. Now, for Marxists, this is the worst thing that you can possibly do. Uh, and also for the neoliberals, this is the worst thing that you can possibly do, because all of these things, then, you know, you're intervening in order, well, on the one hand, you're intervening in order to provide the system to moving into something you think is more acceptable, and the other one is you're preventing the system from moving into the complete opposite system that you also think is more acceptable. And Keynes was sitting in the middle of this and saying, you know, both of these guys, are, both of you guys are nuts. It doesn't work that way. We don't have experience that either one of these things work. And if we don't try to do something to fix it, then the thing is not going to work. But to fix something, you have to know how it works. And this is basically what he was, what he was attempting to do. Now, as I say, you've got all sorts of post-Keynesian theorists who you know, believe that you, know, you have oligopoly pricing. So you get rid of oligopoly pricing. Well, competitive pricing was never that great. So what do you want here? You want to go back to perfectly competitive prices? Probably no, we don't want to do that. Is there something else aside from oligopoly prices? Well, yeah, there's a different way of doing that. But then you've got this problem of direct intervention. You say, okay, we're going to have some sort of price controls and those things. In general, Keynes, aside from war and other uh, other extremes, he didn't believe in price controls. At the end of the general theory, he said, once we get to the point where we've got demand sufficiently high, I'm, you know, I'm sort of confident that the market manages to handle these problems. It's just that we've got to, you know, we have to manage that fringe in which the system doesn't work. So, thank you very much. So, este, ahora hay preguntas del público. Mm -hmm. It's about uh, the relationship between the uh, forward price and, and, and short-term short -term price. It's uh, the uh, interest rate is a difference. And in the present situation, interest rate is increasing in all the world. And the problem that uh, the increase of interest rate is decreasing the economic activity. And uh, the, we are going to have demand in order to support uh, the uh, surplus price. And then uh, enterprises, they decide not to invest. Mm -hmm. 
uh, because they don't have condition in order to realize uh, in their production. That's not a question, Arturo. No, That's no, a no, description. It's, it's an opinion, no. <laughs> in order to. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Um, my question is uh, has relation with liquidity preference, and I like very much your description about uh, the way um, uh, the theory has evolved the MMT. Um, Professor uh, Randall Ray says. Uh, where uh, proposes a growing issue of money supply according with the output requ requirements. What's your opinion about this uh, phenomena on the present times where uh, have short, short gauge or a scarcity of resources like oil? What's your opinion? Thank you very much. Is this working? Yeah, it's working. Okay. The problem that, I mean, the basic problem that I have with MMT is that basically it's a fiscal policy. It's not a monetary policy. It says that you can spend as, the government can spend as much as it wants because it produces the money so that you have no restriction on fiscal policy. Now, as I've tried to suggest, I think this was a false line. As Minsky says, there is more in the general theory than just arguing that fiscal policy can produce the results that you want in terms of the aggregate system. Now, in terms of the rule according to monetary policy, the way MMT adopts this is to say that if the economy is expanding, and there is a positive income elasticity for the demand for money, then the money supply should be growing at a greater rate than the expansion of the economy. If the money that you're creating is only created by government expenditures, then government deficits have to be a permanent component of the money supply, which has to grow at a rate which is faster than the growth rate of the economy. Okay. Now, Milton Friedman already explained this to us when he identified his monetary policy rule. So again, I'm back to this difficulty in that MMT doesn't look at liquidity preference as a determinant of the operation of the system. Okay. MMT looks at, well, they look at money, which is money, the sovereign issue of the state. If we look at the state, okay, issue of sovereign money, okay, if I try to get sovereign U.S. dollars, you know, these paper things, there's no way I can get them from the government. Government would not give them to me. Now, if that's the case, you have a problem. And that problem is that in order to get them, and this is, we'll talk about this tomorrow when we talk about crypto, the same thing is true of crypto. You can't get crypto from an issuer of crypto. The only way you can get crypto is from a bank account. The only way you can get a US dollar is from a bank account. To get a paper dollar, you have to have an account in a bank, okay? That bank is not the US government. That bank is not sovereign. So that going all the way back, Colwell and Fisher, the, the early uh, 20th century, economists pointed out because this state theory of money has been around for over 100 years, they always point out that, well, this is very interesting, but the amount of money which is actually used and in circulation is an extremely small proportion of the total which we identify as money. Okay. I can't remember the, in the introduction of one of Fisher's books. He has it's written by a banker, and a banker points this out. He says, "Well, this is very interesting. Except all the money in the world are bank deposits. Now, the amount of money that is actual government money is extremely is extremely small." 
Okay, so you really can't argue to say it's the, you know, the government does it. Who does it? Well, it's the private banking system that does this. So the rule has to be what? The rule has to be that the government has a deficit which is sufficiently large that it provides assets to the private banking system that allows them to create the liabilities that compose what is the actual effective money stock. Now, again, I would argue that from the point of liquidity preference, number one, you're ignoring the fact that banks themselves have liquidity preference. Okay, You can give them all the government debt that you want. And if they decide that they don't want to engage in lending, they're not going to lend and the money supply is not going to grow. So you can have a deficit that continues to be positive and continues to increase, but the private banking system may not expand the money supply by the rate which is appropriate. Okay, so the problem becomes, you know, it's a little bit more complicated than simply saying that, you know, the deficit, we need the deficit in order to finance the economic growth. We need, in the, the financial institutional framework that we have, the basic determinant of the creation of bank assets is either government deficits or private sector deficits, okay? Entrepreneurs who are borrowing from the banks. Those are the bank's assets. And that determines the liabilities that they create. And the banks manage their balance sheets just as anyone else does in terms of liquidity preference. If they want to be more liquid, they're going to decide that they're going to cut down the amount of private loans that they're going to make, and they're going to increase the amount of government debt which they're going to buy. So you have the same argument that you get in terms of liquidity preference, but in MMT that disappears. You, know, you simply, you know, you simply don't don't discuss it that much. So that my argument would be, if you look at liquidity preference, this emphasis on money per se and the sovereign issue of money misses the point. Because as I finished up, when Keynes was done, he said, well, it really doesn't make any difference if we have physical money or if we have notional money or if we have crypto money or if we have any kind of money. If you have a financial asset, its liquidity, liquidity premium is greater than its carrying costs and the return from holding it is greater than holding any other asset, then it's going to have a negative impact on the system. So again, what you're doing is you're making sure, or the argument should be not that you need the deficit in order to finance the growth, is that you need the appropriate liquidity premium. You have to reduce the liquidity premium on money sufficiently so that the banks and private individuals are willing to enter into contracts for current purchase of inputs against the forward delivery of those uh, outputs that employ labor. And that's the, the framework that you're trying to use. So that, you know, I have nothing against the argument of saying, yes, it may be necessary to have a deficit, you know, a permanent deficit over time in order to satisfy the government's demand to hold liabilities. But the way you make that argument is one in terms of liquidity preference, not in terms of individual preferences for transaction balances. As I said Friedman did the did the argument in terms of the the income elasticity of the demand for money. Okay, fine. I mean that's a good neoclassical concept that uh, that you can use, and it gets you to the same result. So if it does, then it says you know there's something a little bit funny about the way you're proceeding. Thank you.